Good morning. Welcome to St. Columbus. Happy Independence Day, which also happens to be the 4th of July. We're glad to have you with us today, both in person and our friends on live stream as well. We're happy to say that this Thursday, we will be once again resuming our Thursday morning Eucharist. Uh, that will be at 10 o'clock. And for the time being, we'll be in this part of the church, not in the chapel, uh, until we can be a little chummier. But for right now, we'll be there, and we're glad to have that service come back. There are two adult education opportunities coming up uh, during the month of July and into August. They're both printed in the bulletin. They're uh, programs that we are tagging on with Mount Cross doing, although the, <clears throat> the uh, second book discussion is also led by Tim Helton, so uh, we share. And then in August, we'll be hosting our friends from Mount Cross for our uh, summertime uh, stories around the campfire Bible study. So that will be in August. We had some sad news earlier this week that much beloved and longtime music director uh, Martha Lamar died on Monday and services for Martha will be here uh, two weeks from yesterday on July 17th at one o'clock and we'll have more information about that going forward, but do keep Martha and her family in your prayers. Our reader for today's service is Nancy Larkin and our intercessor is Laura Lee Brown. Our music is by Brett Hanley and all of you. We have no song leader today, so you have to sing along. We have good hymns, much Americana, so you can belt it out within reason. And our technical crew are Tim Helton, Nancy Miller, Richard Stone, and Cliff Agan. And we thank them for their support and help. So now let us stand and sing together verses one, two, and five of How Firm a Foundation.
Blessed be the one holy and living God. pray. O oh God, you have taught us to keep your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Our first lesson is from the second book of Samuel. The Israelites, in accord with God's choice, ask David to serve as their king and he begins his four-decade reign. Listen now for the word of God. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, It is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from the Milo inward, and David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 48, found in your bulletin. Let us read it together. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised. In the city of our God is his holy hill. Beautiful and lofty, the joy of all the earth is the hill of Zion the very center of the world and the city of the great king. God is in her citadels. He is known to be her sure refuge. Behold, the kings of the earth assembled and marched forward together. They looked and were astounded. They retreated and fled in terror. Trembling seized them there. They writhed like a woman in childbirth like ships of the sea when the east wind shatters them. As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God has established her forever. We have waited in silence on your loving kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your praise, like your name, O God, reaches to the world's end. Your right hand is full of justice. 
Let Mount Zion be glad, and the cities of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Make the circuit of Zion, walk round about her, count the number of her towers, consider well her bulwarks, examine her strongholds, that you may tell those who come after, this God is our God forever and ever. He shall be our God forevermore. Our second lesson comes from the second lesson, second letter to the Corinthians. Paul tells the Corinthians that he could boast, but he refrains because he knows that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Listen now for the word of God. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Jesus Christ, 
according to St. Mark. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. Now on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord.
Hello, please sit down, sit down. Welcome to Christ Church Philadelphia. It is so good to have you all join us here today. Oh, you might be wondering who I am. Well, I am William White. I am the rector here at Christ Church, and we're so happy that you could come for a visit. <coughs> And besides being the rector here, I'm also the Bishop of Pennsylvania. In fact, I'm the first Bishop of Pennsylvania in the Bishop, and I'm also the first presiding Bishop of our new church, the Episcopal Church. Do you like the name? We just picked it out at our recent general convention. It was, it was supplied by our friends down in Maryland who suggested it. It means bishops, a church overseen by bishops, Episcopal. Has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? You see, after the War of Independence, that thing you celebrate on July the 4th, it was a very confusing time for us in the church. You see, all of our priests and clergy came from England, and all of our guidance came from England. In fact, all the churches in the colonies were under the leadership of the Bishop of London. The Bishop of London had responsibility for the churches in all the colonies, not just one, but all. And many of the clergy were loyal to England. And so when the British left, so did the clergy. And so we were wondering, or most of the clergy, and we were wondering just, just what we would do, and we had to figure out how we as a church could exist. Could we even continue, or would we either have to give up and go to England or let the Methodists and the Quakers take over church in the colonies? And now, in this new country, that we were trying to create. So while my friends George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison were trying to figure out how to put a country together, I was working with some of those same folks to try to figure out how to put a church together. They were working on a constitution for the country. We were working on a constitution for the church. In fact, I used to have a little joke that since it was some of the same people, they would come to Christ Church in the morning and work on the Constitution for the church, and then in the afternoon and the evening after Franklin got up, they would go and come to the Independence Hall and work on a Constitution for the country. Oh, you didn't know that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison were my friends? Oh, yeah. You see, one of my other jobs was to be the chaplain for the Continental Congress. So I was the chaplain all through the war and then right on up until the Congress moved to New York City, where they are now, but soon they will be moving to the new capital that's being built in Washington City. It's kind of an interesting story how I got that job. See, I was ordained as uh, assistant minister here at Christ Church in 1772. And my boss, who was the rector of Christ Church then, was the chaplain to the Con Continental Congress. And he was very in favor of the revolution right up until the British marched into Philadelphia. And when they left, he left too, because he'd switched sides. So the vestry at Christ Church asked me to become the rector. 
and the Congress asked me to become their chaplain. And since I was the only cleric in Pennsylvania in favor of the revolution, I got the job. So I was chaplain of the Congress, the Continental Congress, from 1777 to 1789. It was, as I said, a kind of confusing time for after we were granted our independence, we had to figure out how to be a church. There were no dioceses or any units like that. We were just colonies. And so now as states, I proposed that each state should have a convention. And that convention should elect clergy and lay people to come together and meet. And then they should each send representatives to a national general convention that we would have to help to make things to figure things out, to figure out what we were gonna do for a church. And so we did that and our first general convention was in 1785. We came together as the House of Deputies because that's all there were, deputies, clergy and laity. I was elected the president and we began to meet to consider how to set up the church. At the same time, we are trying to figure out how and if we could get bishops. So the folks down Connecticut way uh, elected Samuel Seabury and asked him if he would go to England and see if he could be made a bishop. And so he went and the bishops said they could not ordain him unless he would swear allegiance to the king. Well, what had we just fought a war about? So even though he was a Tory and had served in the British army, he was now an American. And so Samuel Seabury said, no, he could not in good conscience swear an oath to the king. And so, they said, sorry, we cannot ordain you bishops. So he tried the bishops in Scotland because they were of a little different branch of the church. And the bishops in Scotland, they weren't going to make him swear allegiance to the king. They barely had allegiance to the king. So they went ahead and ordained him, Samuel Seabury, as a bishop. And he came back as the first bishop in the Episcopal Church. He was the Bishop of Connecticut. The deal he made was that if he could, he would see that the new prayer book we were following would follow the Scottish order when you celebrate Holy Communion. And if you look at your prayer book, it does. So then the folks in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania said, well, hey, if Connecticut's got a bishop, we want a bishop. So they elected me and I went along with Samuel Provost from New York in 18, sorry, 1787. And we went to England and this time the English bishops had figured out that if they didn't ordain us, we would go to Scotland too. And then they'd have no connection with the church and no influence with this brand new baby church and so they or consented to ordain both provost and me and so then we came together for a second general convention in 1789 and we put in place all the things that I had been working on a two house legislature the house of deputies and the house of bishops sound familiar Remember those same guys were working on both constitutions. Remember also the House of Deputies is older than the House of Bishops. The House of Bishops is the junior house in the general convention. The deputies were formed in 1785, the House of Bishops in 1789, 1789 when we actually had some bishops. And 
then it was at that convention that we adopted that new name, Episcopal. What a ring, Episcopal. Now, it's interesting being a bishop here in Philadelphia. Some of the other bishops give me a bad time because I don't just sit around in my church and wait for other people to come to me like they do. I got on my horse and I rode around and went to visit congregations in my diocese. I even went all the way out to the wild and woolly west there along the Ohio River to the wilds of Pittsburgh. You laugh, those are dangerous people out there on the frontier in Pittsburgh, let me tell you. It is a wild and rough time. But I went to Pittsburgh and the other towns along the Ohio River to help strengthen the congregations and to visit with the clergy that were there. And I've been busy in Philadelphia too, for we have founded the Philadelphia Dispensary to bring medical aid to the poor. And we also started the Pennsylvania Institute for the Deaf and the Mute, as well as the Philadelphia Society for Alleviating Ministries, sorry, Alleviating Miseries of Public Prisons. But my favorite thing is this new thing that we just started. It's called Sunday school. You see, the children have to go to work now at such a young age and we hardly have a chance to teach them anything. And so since Sunday is a day of rest and they don't work, they can come to church and then following church, we can meet together and we can teach them reading and writing and arithmetic and they can learn how to read and write. So I just love this new Sunday school and this new thing that we've brought about. You know, it reminds me my life somewhat of a gospel story that you may have heard some time about Jesus sending out the 12 and telling them not to take a bag or money or sandals or, or just wear sandals and not to worry about things. And he sent them out and they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what they were going to do. And you never know how the Lord can use you. Here, I thought I'd just be a simple parish priest here in Philadelphia. Little did I know what God had in store. But I found if you put yourself in God's hands, everything will come out right. You just need to have faith. You just need to trust. And as you put yourself in God's hands, know that God will be working through you. Well, I am so glad you came to visit today. Do drop in again next time you're here in Philadelphia. I've got a Sunday school meeting to get to and I don't wanna miss it. I'm so excited about this new program. So do visit again next time and we will see you soon. But in the meantime, would you please stand as you are able and join in the creed, in the words of the Iona community. We believe in God.
ever-present God, you come to us through the teaching of your Son, Jesus Christ, risen and manifest in every place and time. Grant that our eyes and ears may be open to his wisdom and his healing, that we may be sent forth in his name to do the work that he calls us to do as we pray. To you we lift up our eyes, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. Gracious God, you have given authority to your church over many things that threaten your creation. Grant us the grace of your spirit that we may teach with Christ's wisdom and perform his deeds of power for the healing of the world. To you we lift up our eyes, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. Let our nation hear the words of your prophets to reveal our impudence and stubbornness to change our hearts. Give us just and compassionate leaders and protect our bulwarks and strongholds that we may be a people of hospitality, hospitality, welcoming your work of reconciliation and obeying your right hand of justice. To you we lift up our eyes, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. Let your compassionate spirit go forth throughout the world to comfort and uphold all who suffer any form of weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, that they may be upheld by your strength and justice. To you we lift up our eyes, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. Enable this community to see and to hear heavenly things and to treasure the mystery of your revelation so dearly that we may recognize and accept the unexpected gifts offered to us by our neighbors, family, and friends. To you we lift up our eyes, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. Strengthen us humbly to persevere through our tribulations, O God, and heal us all who need your gift of mercy. We thank you for your goodness revealed in all the blessings of life. To you we lift up our eyes, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. We pray for the church, for our bishops Justin, Michael, John, and Diane, for St. Columbus, the Threshold Project, our Children's Learning Center, our Project Hope Food Ministries, and our clergy and staff. We pray for those with immediate needs, Ron, Caitlin, Marlene, Jen, Josette, Paula, Bruce, Jillian, Melissa, Bruce, Terry, Gail, Sylvia, Sari, Sarah, Nancy, Vicki, Kylie, Jerry, Gail, Pedro, Jackie, Marilyn, Sandy, Maggie, Nazar, Sandy, Denise, Robbie, Rob, Bill, Richard, Dick, Lisa, Savannah, Augustine, Mona, Val, and Joyce. And we pray for those who need our continuing prayers whose names are in our bulletin. And we also pray for the repose of the soul of Martha Lamar and for her family and friends. We give thanks for all the members of our St. Columbus Parish family. We pray for the world, for all who are suffering, suffering or have died because of the coronavirus pandemic, for all victims of violence and to turn the hearts of those who would do harm, for all who have suffered because of the sin of racism and oppression, for those affected by natural disasters, especially wildfires, for peace in the Middle East and all troubled areas of the world, for all those serving at home and abroad, Liam, Simon, Matthew, Matt, Nathan, Jonah, David, Noah, Garrett, DeLondon, and Marty. And we are thankful for the flowers on the high altar that are given to the glory of God by Anne Luthringer to commemorate our nation's birthday and to celebrate all Americans working together to defeat COVID-19. And now you may add your own prayers in silence or aloud. Let your infinite grace, O oh Father, free us from all attachment cynicism and fear 
that we may participate in your universal mission of teaching and healing through the reconciling spirit of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And on this Independence Day weekend, we pray for our country. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly pray you that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of your favor and glad to do your will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in your name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to your law, we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness. And in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in you to fail. All which we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Would you stand, please, as you are able? The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet those around you gently. And now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. And we will sing together hymn 719, America the Beautiful, found printed in your bulletin.
Our service continues with the Eucharistic prayer as found printed in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal element you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption 
and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. We celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our ancestors, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Hannah, Esther, and Ruth, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken that we may be whole. This cup has promised by God Let us pray together with those who could not be with us today the prayer of spiritual communion found printed in your bulletin. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of the church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire of God for the people of God. Please come forward following the direction of the usher one row at a time. You may be seated.
The post-communion prayer is found printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And now may the blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, and of the Holy Spirit who broods over creation as a mother over her children, be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Now let us stand as you are able and sing together our closing hymn, God of our Fathers. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.